ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وسلم All praise is due to Allah. We praise Him, we seek His help, and we seek His forgiveness. We seek refuge in Allah from the evil of ourselves and from our bad deeds. Whoever Allah guides, there is no one that can lead Him astray, and whoever Allah allows to go astray, no one can guide Him. I bear witness and open testimony that there is nothing worthy of worship and obedience except Allah. He's alone without any partners. And I reject all false gods and ideologies and religions. And I bear witness that Muhammad is His messenger and His servant. First of all, I'd like to welcome everybody here. And first of all, again, I want to thank Brother Isa and the rest of the ICOI for inviting me. And uh, may Allah bless them tremendously. Uh, I want to thank the youth here, the brothers and the sisters, for coming out on this Friday evening. I know you got better things to do probably than listen to a guy with a huge beard who just came out of the desert. I know that for sure. I mean, you have to be cooler in life than to come to the masjid and hear somebody like me talk. So I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to sit before you and to, to share something with you, inshaAllah ta'ala. And uh, bear with me, inshaAllah, about 20 to 30 minutes. I love you all for the sake of Allah. And I ask Allah Azza wa Jal as He gathered us here today to gather us in the highest forms of paradise. I really appreciate whoever came from, from long distance. I really appreciate that they made the drive here. So may Allah bless them and accept from them. Um, you know, they told me there's going to be parents and youth. But either, mashallah, the men in this crowd have a lot of children. Like, mashallah, they have multiple wives probably and many children. Or I'm only getting the youth part of this and just a few parents. So for you who are parents here, inshallah, bear with us. We're going to turn it to another station right now. So just hold on tight to your seats, put your seat belts on, inshallah, because I'm mainly going to be speaking to the brothers and the sisters that are closer to my age. So don't let the beard fool you, I am close to your generation, and I understand what you're going through. And I remember right before the month of Ramadan in high school, I went to North Hollywood High in the valley. And this is like a Hollywood story that you're hearing. A true Hollywood story. But it's not on TV. It's only on ICOI.net. A brother, Persian kid. His name was Reza. I didn't know what Reza meant at the time. I found out later that Reza is Rida. And Rida is from Imam Ali Rida and so forth. So I got educated. Reza was a kid we played basketball with. And he was a pretty boy. He used to pluck his eyebrows. That's the first time I ever knew that guys can pluck their eyebrows. He told me, Ahmed, well, I used to be called Ahmad. He says, Ahmad, why don't you pluck your eyebrows? Everybody does it. Why you keep them bushy like that? I said, man, it's not part of my culture. So I let them be bushy and then I got some more you know, hair on my face. Reza, one year, we were sitting on the bleachers of the basketball gym in high school. And he told me, so you're going to do Rosa? You're going to do Rosa? And like my first language is not Persian. I knew Shami Arabic growing up because that's where our family comes from. So I said, what's that, man? He says, that means you fast. I said, yeah, yeah, Ramadan. He's like, yeah, Ramzan, Ramzan. I said, yep, inshallah, we're going to be fasting in the month of Ramadan soon. I had no clue that Reza was a Muslim. No clue whatsoever. In fact, most people probably didn't know that Ahmad was a Muslim either. Now, Ahmad came from a decent family. We prayed five times a day. We fasted the month of Ramadan, believe it or not. You know, pretty conservative family. I didn't look like this all my life. I used to be a child before. <laughs> believe that as well. But in all honesty, you know, my father came to this country so I can get a high education and I can become a doctor. May Allah bless him and reward him for that. So he had a specific goal. And I'm sure a lot of the families here, I don't see many reavers. I see my man Yaqub, and that's probably it as far as the reavers are concerned. So I'm going to be speaking about people who have immigrant background for the most part. So a lot of our parents came to this country, of course, for a better life opportunity in general, for a better education, and so forth. So my father was no exception. Now, all the way till I went to school, I was going to be a doctor. I was in pre-med and had a scholarship. Smart kid. 
just like a lot of the kids here. Very good in school. Because my parents' main objective was that you do good in school. That's what you're supposed to do. And I'm sure all the brothers here, the parents, they agree with me. That's, that's their main thing. They tell their kids, look, we'll give you everything you want. I don't know what you guys want now. I, I heard there's PlayStation and Xbox and other types of boxes and a whole bunch of things that kids request these days. You know, I'm from like the 90s, so that's not cool anymore. That's called old school, so just bear with me. But the parent will tell their children, I'll get you anything you want. I just want you to concentrate. I want you to get a good education. I want you to get a good job and to have financial security, which is great. That's what the parents care about. They want us to be in good conditions. They don't want us growing up begging or being a bum, being homeless and so forth. So that's all good. Unfortunately, and I want to tie into what our Sheikh Taha spoke about earlier, when he says when he looked at the newspapers in the Middle East and what people's concerns are, it's all about groceries and how to shop for the month of Ramzan, how to, how to fast, and not how to fast, but how to go on shopping sprees and collect food, not just for one month, but for, mashallah, the whole year. Because you're going to be cooking extra and you're going to be gaining weight. Even though it's called the month of fasting, abstinence, you're supposed to let go of food a bit. But what we're doing is indulging more in food because mama cooks the best food during Ramadan and all the aunties cook the best food during Ramadan. The masjid decides to have dinners every night in Ramadan. Maybe your masjid is like, I don't know, a couple of times a week. I'm not sure. But anyway, the best food from all over earth is right here in the month of Ramadan. And instead of being abstinence, losing a bit of weight, feeling more for the hungry, mashallah, we eat more, we gain more weight, and we go on shopping sprees. The reason for that at least in my understanding, which is very limited, but bear with me, is because people unfortunately have become heedless to their purpose of existence. And that's what uh, the sister, may Allah bless her and reward her, told me that we want to discuss. How do we tie in the month of Ramadan, preparing for the month of Ramadan with our purpose of existence? Well, basically that's what happened with me, because I'm just going to go ahead and share my story with, with you, because they just introduced me as a guy who just came from the desert, but luckily I speak English, so you can understand me. So I'm going to introduce myself. So, I knew that what I was supposed to do was become a doctor. As far as I'm concerned, that was my purpose of existence. I didn't know any better. And I'm sure a lot of people do. I mean, you guys are the cream of the crop. You guys are here in the masjid, you're not clubbing, right? You're not out doing something Friday night, TGIF. You know, you ain't doing that. You're, you're in the masjid, mashallah. So may Allah reward you for that. May Allah bless you. But I know that you know a lot of Muslims. And maybe if you had the chance and your parents didn't twist your arm and tell you, come check this guy out from the desert, you wouldn't be here either. So I really appreciate the fact that you're spending your time here. The reason for that is because we really don't know. Like, why should I come to this mosque? It's really Ramadan, Salah. A lot of these things that we do, and we call ourselves Muslims and so forth, which is very good. And a lot of us come from good families, decent families. We try to do that, which is good. It's more of tradition, cultural tradition than anything else. Most of us have not had a, a conversion. Most of us were just born with a Muslim name, like myself. I was born with the name Ahmed. I didn't really work hard for it. In university, I met people for the first time who actually were something else and they became Muslim. I used to hear about these guys when I was in high school. But in, in university, I met one guy. He was like 40 years old, Brother Amir, local from South, Southern California. I met with him after 10 years, last year, I think. He had become Muslim in prison. Now, this guy had a special impact on me. We played ball. He was 40 years old, but he can ball all of us combined. We were like teenagers still, 17, 18. But Brother Amir, mashallah, had some skills. But the skill that touched me the most was the fact that he said... You know, he'd converted to Islam, he's become Muslim now, and so forth. But one time, you know, we sat down and he sat next to me. This is a 40-year-old man, and at the time, I think I was 17. After playing basketball, we're kind of tired, and he says, I can play ball. I didn't play last week, but I, can play. I think I might come tomorrow morning. They invited me. For the brothers who have basketball courts, Friday night, uh, I mean Saturday morning. So the brother told me, he says, Ahmed, and he started crying. This is a 40-year-old grown-up. He says, Ahmed, you know what? You're lucky. I said, why am I lucky, man? You got all the skills. I don't have nothing. I'm trying to make it to the NBA, but I, I don't have the right genes. <laughs> you know, I'm from a different area in the world, which is a lot of the youth is, you know, they're, they're, that's their dream. He says, because Ahmed, your mom is a Muslim, but my mom died and she's going to the hellfire. And he started crying. I said, why is she going to the hellfire? He says, because she's not Muslim. She died and she was not in a state of Islam. Amir, I believe, and a lot of brothers who have a 
conversion experience, they recognize their purpose of life and they did not do it by just being born into a Muslim family and taking it for granted. And that's really what I want to talk to you about today. We take a lot of things that we have for granted. The masjid that we have, the community events that we have, our parents, Quran, Sunnah, Islam in general, we take it for granted because we don't recognize the value for it and there's no problem with that. There's, that's actually real. Why would I blame somebody if they don't know the value of something, they can't really take care of it. That's, that's cool. So what I want to you know, remind myself and whoever hears me inshallah ta'ala is, I think this should be a time because everyone, as you know, everyone around the globe, even on CNN now, for the last few years, whenever I watch CNN during Ramadan, they all say, and the Muslims have started their holy month, the fasting month, the month of Ramadan. They do that even on CNN and BBC. So the whole world is saying that Ramadan is something special. It's a month of worship, Shaykh Taha told us, the month of Ramadan the month of, is the month of the Qur'an, the month of fasting, the month of charity, the month of bringing family ties together, the month of you know, feeding the poor, the month of feeling for the less fortunate and so forth. But as far as I'm concerned, the month of Ramadan is something more special. And I actually had my experience in the month of Ramadan in the MSU or MSA, the, the, student, the Muslim student club. And it was a Persian brother, mind you, his name is Amir from... Irvine, I believe, or he spent some time in Irvine, who happened to be the president of the MSA at that time. And I spent the whole 29th night of Ramadan with him in the masjid, in this community around Riverside. I mean, there's no problem in mentioning Masajid, right? Hopefully they won't get blacklisted because I had my conversion experience in their premises. So, I spent the whole night with Brother Amir. He explained to me what the MSA is all about. You know, how the brothers, the Muslim brothers, they come together, the sisters. You know, they try to learn Islam. It's kind of like a struggle. Their parents came here for a better education, for a better job opportunity. But you know, they're trying their hardest. You know, just like the youth group here. They're trying their hardest to, to do things. You know, the, the brother, may Allah reward him, he recited the translation of the meanings of the Quran earlier. The MC, Haytham, who, who, who you know, presented me to you. The sister who's, who's working in the office. All these youth are trying their best. You know, they're trying their best to come closer to Islam. But I think it would become way easier for us to come close to Islam if we recognize our purpose of existence. If you recognize that, Islam no longer becomes a tradition. Islam no longer becomes something that I'm doing to please my parents. Because my parents raised me up in a good way. My parents expect me to do namaz and to do roza and to do ramzan and they call me reza and this and that. I'm on a flow right now, I'm flowing. All with disease, you know. In Arabic it's all dad, 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 but... Ramadan, Rida, and so forth. So instead of having my parents form, force me to do something, or me doing something really, I'm not feeling it. But you know, I just don't want to disgrace my family. I, I see a lot of youth, and this is what they are. That, I mean, th these are some of the best kids we have. And they're like, you know what, man, the only reason I'm doing this is just because I don't want to let my dad feel bad. I don't want to make my dad feel like he's a failure. So this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. I don't want you to do that. Now, I'm not saying leave Islam. Of course, a lot of people have left Islam. I'm sure you know some kids who've left Islam. I met a few myself. You know, they left Islam, they're like in a completely different planet. Something's wrong with them. May Allah guide them. But people make their choices and this is a free country and you're supposed to make your conscious decision once you become an adult. I want to remind everyone to search for your purpose of life. And today I'm sharing with you basically what I did. Instead of studying medicine, I went on a soul-searching path after I met with brother Amir, who was the convert American, who became Muslim in the prison, and who told me, Ahmed, you're lucky because your mom is not going to go to the hellfire and she's not going to fry. So after that, I looked at myself and I said, okay, my name is Ahmed. I come from somewhere in the Middle East. Uh, Amir says that I'm lucky and I'm going to go to paradise just because I'm Muslim. What is this Islam all about? Is this really the truth? Or is it something that my parents gave me and I just have? And I think we all should have that type of mentality. We should all look and research and see if what we're doing is correct or not. And be convinced. Don't just blindly follow anybody. It doesn't matter who it is. The imam, the speaker, the president of the country, the masjid, what have you. Don't follow anybody blindly. It's good to be respectful, but I want you to do your own researching. And I am guarantee you that everybody who truly researches with sincerity is going to find their purpose of existence. But you just have to be sincere and truthful in it. So I'm not putting doubts in anybody's heart. I'm just telling you, stop putting up a front and trying to imitate people and coming to the masjid on, on a seasonal basis. And that's what Muslims do. 
Alhamdulillah, I mean, Sheikh Taha mentioned, and I'm very pleased, mashallah, in Southern California, you got, you know, Disneyland right around the corner, Six Flags, you got Hollywood where I'm from, Studio City, but you're leaving all that, not naming all the clubs that I don't know of, but you left all of that and you came here. And you come into the masjid, which means there is something good in you, alhamdulillah, and that's a blessing. So I want you to increase on that goodness that you already have. I don't want you to give up. But at the same time, I just don't want you to be pleased with your situation. Ramadan is a time to change, to, to change bad habits, and we all see that. People who can't pray regularly, mashallah, in the month of Ramadan, they become saints. They're here all the time, the whole day. Brother, what you doing? Don't you have school? No, man, I took, I took the month off. Right? Your message is so special. Last year, I remember, I met brothers who, let, like, who came from out of the state, maybe some people out of the country. I think there were a few who came out of the country to live in Irvine for one month so they can pray behind the reciter that we have. So may Allah bless them. People put an effort. I want you to put a smaller effort. Sheikh Taha spoke about all the extra things we can do in Ramadan, and I agree with that. But you know, to a youth, a person who's like you and I, we're not even feeling it to begin with. Why should I be doing extra work, man? I'm just doing the bare minimum because my parents want me to do it. But I want you to know why you're doing it. I want you to recognize your purpose of existence. And Islam has that answer for you that nobody else has. Allah Azza wa made it very clearly, and that's what they asked me to do as well. How can we change our relationship with the Qur'an? The Qur'an has the ability to transform individuals. That's the best miracle amongst the miracles of the Qur'an. Transformers, not the, vo the movie. Not the movie, not science fiction. But Qur'an has the ability to transform any individual, in any condition, in any place on earth, to the best. And if you want a lovely story to hear that, documented in history, read the Sahaba's history. The companions of Prophet Muhammad Who were they before? And who were they after? I don't need to say much more than that. They were illiterate, ignorant, naked, barefooted, uneducated, in the middle of the desert where I live today, on the outskirts of civilization. People didn't care about them. They didn't even want to bug them and they didn't want to take their land because they had no natural resources whatsoever. And people didn't depend on fossil fuels at that time and they hadn't discovered it either. So they were nowhere to be mentioned. All of a sudden, with the Qur'an, the month of Ramadan is the month of the Qur'an. We want to go back and to transform ourselves through this book. And I'm just going to share a few verses with it that can give you that ability to transform. Because they dealt with the Qur'an in a special fashion, they recognized their purpose of existence, they changed their lives around, and they worshipped Allah Azza wa Jal the way He wants them to be worshipped. And that is your purpose of existence. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I've only created mankind and the spiritual, spiritual world, the jinn, to worship me and obey me. That's the only reason. That's the main purpose of existence. Now you might have heard this before, and you say, da 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 we heard this before, man, all you preachers have to say is, this is the purpose of existence, you guys want us to pray all the day, all day long, all night long, stay in the masjid, give charity, whatever we have, give it up, you know, go to live in Mecca and Medina, live like you in the desert and this and that. That's not what I'm telling you to do. I'm telling you, your purpose of life is to worship Allah and to obey Him. And Allah Azza wa Jal made that very clear, so it's not like something, uh, a mystery, it's not something that's uh, ambiguous, that is not clear. But we just have to search for it, and then we have to be convinced about it. Now when you recognize that that's your purpose of existence, then you gear your whole life towards that, and you become like the Sahaba. And the Sahaba lived one of the verses in particular in the Qur'an, they lived the whole Qur'an, but one in particular, قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ they said, we dedicate all of our life, our prayer, our sacrifice, our life and our death, all of it to Allah, the Lord of everything, the Creator who created us and gave us everything that we have. We recognize our purpose of life, which is to dedicate everything to Him. That does not mean give up everything that you have. But what it means is that you liberate yourself from every type of servitude. And you get into the servitude of the Creator who deserves to be served. And only Him. Complete liberation, complete independence, but you're only dependent on Allah Azza wa Jal. And that's the purpose of existence. Once I recognized that, subhanAllah, it really had an influence on me and I had a conversion experience. And some of the brothers today after khutbah, he's like, brother, did you say you were a convert? I said, yeah, I kind of like I'm a convert, but I got a special story. He says, oh, like you went and came back. I said, la, la, I went and came back. So people might have gone, but the month of Ramadan is the time to come back. It's back to Ramadan week. 
Like you know they have back to school and you go shopping. The Middle Eastern stores, they all have back to Ramadan stores. You know, back to Ramadan means everything is 50% off, maybe more off. Maybe completely off. Just come and buy things. That's all they care about. You know, their business. Because they're marketing and they have a marketing strategy. So likewise, let's do a back to Ramadan season for our own selves. But first of all, recognize why you have to fast the month of Ramadan. If you don't know your purpose, if you don't know where you're headed, if you don't know your goal, what's the point of people like scholars like Shaykh Taha speaking to you about all the virtues? And Prophet Muhammad said such and such, and Allah said such and such. And as far as you're concerned, you're just like any average Joe on the street who's like, you know what, that's special, but it doesn't really relate to me, I can care less. If you were to tell the non-Muslim right now, Allah says, he made fasting, he enjoyed fasting upon us just like he enjoyed it upon the people of the book before us in order for us to achieve taqwa. The first verse the, br the brother translated. He's going to be like, what does that mean? What do I care? You want me to leave my food and my drink? And you want me to leave getting laid the whole day because I need to achieve taqwa? What is taqwa and so forth? And then you get in a big deba debate. But the Muslim who recognizes his purpose and the Muslim who knows why he, he is in existence, he recognizes that Allah Azza wa is so kind, is so merciful to his creation. He always gives them seasons to come back to him. He gives us seasons to come back to Him because He knows in our nature, we're human beings, we're weak, we make mistakes. But every once in a while, He gives us a season. And the marketing strategy is, this is a season for you to end up in paradise. Because this life is temporary. This life is deceptive. This life is not real. This life is short. Maximum how, how much? 100 years? I read an article, like the oldest woman on earth, how old is she? 120, something like that, 125. Okay, let's say you're going to live that long. Unfortunately, you might have a miserable life. May Allah protect us from that. Living long might not be the best thing. But it's how you lived your life that means it all. And then your everlasting life, because we all have that. And that's what we believe in Islam, is that we will have an everlasting life. If you don't believe in that, I want you to research and to really have that belief inside of you. Because if you don't have certain beliefs, you're no longer considered a Muslim. Maybe you were never Muslim to begin with. And this is not to offend anyone. This is actually, I'm extending my arms. I'm telling you, I love you for the sake of Allah. I want you to hold my arm and we both jump in paradise. And there's nothing about me being better than you and me being guaranteed paradise just because of the way I look or because I live in the desert. I want us all to be there just like we are here today. And I want us to reminisce these days when life was tough. When you had to fast in Southern California where the girls are naked and you got to lower your gaze. And when the brothers or the men are trying to hit on the beautiful sisters and she's trying to be modest. Because this is what Islam teaches her. But what I want is we want to recognize why we do the things we do. Is it just because we had a good upbringing? Mama said, don't look at the boys. Baba said, don't look at the girls. That's the way I do my thing. That's not the reason why you do things. It's because Allah Azza wa told you lower your gaze. And Allah Azza wa told you keep your modesty. But you have to recognize who Allah Azza wa is. And Allah is something strange to us. So seasons come where Allah is calling us to Him. But we're like, why should we go to Him? We don't even know who He is. Who is Allah? Oh yeah, Allah is God. Okay, what do you know about God? Uh, not much, really. Can you talk to me about God? I, I watched like a, a little clip a few days ago. And this is in the Middle East, in one of the, you know, foundational areas of Islam, you know. And they went and asked college students. They're like, name me 10 soccer players. Soccer is the most famous international sport. You guys witnessed the World Cup recently. T name 10 soccer players. They were able to. Ten, uh, name 10 singers, musicians. They were able to. Name 10 Sahaba. The guy said, who? <laughs> like he has no clue. Of course, Sahaba might be something trivial. If you don't care who your founding fathers are, if you don't care who established this deen on earth, that's fine. But before knowing who the Sahaba is, because that's what we get ourselves involved in, in our plans for Ramadan and other things, we get our youth involved in something that might be trivial to them. I don't want to undermine what our scholars talk about. But it might be really trivial. We might be speaking, but it's really going over everybody's head. Like, what is he talking about? Fasting, yeah, and charity. And get your checkbook ready. I ain't got a checkbook. I'm broke. What do you want me to get my checkbook for? Don't blame the sheikh for that. He's telling you the truth. That's the reality. But when we don't recognize why we're doing the things we're doing, even if you're broke, when the sheikh tells you that and you recognize who Allah Azza wa Jal is, you're like, if I don't have a checkbook, I'm about to get a checkbook because I'm going to give my check and I'm going to give my money because this is a, 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 a very winning cause. This is a cause of success. This is going to grant me something good in my life. It's going to grant me success. So when we recognize our purpose of existence, which is to worship Allah and to obey Him. But in Islam, it's so special that anything you do in life, 
When you have the positive intention and it goes in accordance with the rulings of Islam, it's considered an act of worship. In Islam, we don't have monasteries. You don't go lock yourself up and become a monk and say, you know what, I'm going to divorce this life and I'm just going to go. I'm not going to talk to the opposite gender. I'm just going to be completely elsewhere. No. It's like brothers who are running the masjid and brothers who are running the school and brothers and sisters. Sorry, I'm not mentioning sisters. But a lot of sisters actually, from what I understand, do more work than brothers. A sister today sent me an email. I thought it was a brother. Her name is Rayhan. So I thought I was talking to a brother because look at the preconceived notion that I have. Somebody who's going to contact me from the masjid is going to be a brother. But then the sister called me. And she knows my name, but I don't know who she is. And then I found out she's a girl because she sounded like a girl. So of course, I had sent the email before the phone conversation. So there is a lot of sisters as well doing a lot of positive things. Alhamdulillah, these brothers and sisters, may Allah bless them, they're living life. But to a large extent, I believe they all went through that soul searching phase. I think some of them have. Because we all went to school. I know a lot of them went to UCI. I went to UCR. You know, and a lot of the brothers and sisters have that phase. And maybe some of them in high school even before us. You know, before, before we had the wake up call. Something had to wake us up. With me, it was brother Amir, for example, and other things in my life. But everybody has their wake up call. But that wake up call, this is a time, a wake up call, Ramadan. When the whole world is changing, shaitan himself is getting chained up. And in case you don't know who that is, that's the bad guy. That's the devil, that's the one that's trying to get you to fry with him in the hellfire. You know, he does not like you. He just loves for you to get barbecued with him in the next life. Unfortunately, you're going to be frying everlastingly if you follow his lead. But then if you follow Allah's guidance and you follow the Quran and the Sunnah, بِإِذْنِ you're going to have everlasting bliss. And you're going to enjoy that life to come. And then you're going to reminisce on this temporary life. And you're like, wow, it was so short. And then you're going to regret and you're going to say, why did I not implement what Shaykh Taha said during Ramadan? Why did I not take advantage of the month of Ramadan? Why didn't I fast more? Why didn't I pray more? Why didn't I stay more in the masjid? Why didn't I treat my parents kindly? Why didn't I give charity? X, Y, and Z, etc., etc. Why didn't I do all these things? Because at that day, you'll realize the value of those actions. Right now, you can't realize it. I mean, Allah blesses some people, mashallah. They give charity and Allah gives them things back. But as I spoke about the khutbah last week, this life is a test. And the better you are, the more you're going to be tested. So when you're going to be tested more, you're going to have difficulties. Young brothers and sisters trying to get married, and all the doors are closed for some reason. That's the difficulty of this life. That's the difficulty of this life. What are you going to be doing? Are you going to be patiently persevering that and looking forward to what Allah Azza wa has in plan for you? And so forth. Recognizing your purpose of life, which is to worship and obey Allah, to put His commandments. And the only way we can do that is to learn some of the basics about this way of life. So first and foremost, I want you before anything else, before you think about fasting, and before our brother, may Allah reward him, Rayhan tells you about all the fitness benefits of it. He knows because that's his field of expertise. That's his cup of tea, right? But a lot of us don't work out. We're going to be like, man, what kind of benefits are there? Like one of my cousins, I read some comment, he says, he says, time to starve to death. Oh, Allah, I'm going to be starving to death. You're not going to be starving to death. You're going to be starving for death. Because death is going to come. But you're just preparing for it. That's, that's all you're doing. You're gearing your life up to that purpose of life. Anything that you do with the right intention, when it goes in accordance with Allah's rules and regulations, is considered an act of worship, a ibadah. And you're going to get rewarded for it. A smile is charity in Islam. When someone has marital relations, the legal sex, that's charity in Islam. When someone pays money, that, that word is not banned in the masjid, I hope. But that's a real word that everybody hears. And I did not use the x rated terms. I am kind of explicit because I'm just like you guys. You're hearing worse things that I can't even say. So you have to be real when you come to the masjid. You have to hear something that's real. I know that we might be feeling it. And I felt when I was in your shoes, Wallahi, I did not have the opportunity. I don't remember, Muhammad, did we ever have a preparation for Ramadan? And our whole life, when we went to high school, middle school, elementary school, never. And we were in Southern California, so Allah has blessed you. The people, they're trying their best to, to bring you closer, and they're, they're striving, may Allah bless them. I was in your shoes one day, and I didn't know other than, this is my good upbringing, and I'm a good person. I'm not like these Americans, you know, but I really don't know who I am. I really don't, I'm just a Muslim. But you know what they knew as? They knew that Ahmad was the guy who doesn't date girls, who doesn't eat pork, and he doesn't party. He plays good basketball, but they couldn't believe that. Like, how can you be a basketball player and a jock, but not be cool with the cheerleaders? I don't know, it beats me, but... That's, what, that's all they knew about me, and that's all they knew about Islam. That was 2,000 students that I was with. 
Not too long ago, only about 10, 10, <laughs> maybe 10 years ago. Not too long ago. But I was in your shoes and I was thinking, why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I starving? Why am I praying five times a day? And I remember I used to dread it. In the house we used to pray in congregation. And we used to have to wake up for Fajr. And sometimes Fajr is really early. And I just hope one day they miss me and they don't wake me up. Not because I didn't like Salah, I loved it, it was cool. For me, it wasn't, you know, when you get trained to do something at a young age, it's not a big deal for you, you like it. But that doesn't mean you're convinced, and that doesn't mean that you know why you're doing it. But when I had the conversion experience, after I met someone who converted, that made me recognize why we do all the things that we do. So now I became grateful to my parents. At a time, I was really like, Mom and Dad, why are you guys so crazy? Now I'm a parent myself, and I'm becoming crazier than my mom and dad. And all of you guys will feel the same way once you become parents. You don't know it yet. Look, man, I swear to you, I was saying to myself, I'm not going to speak the way my dad speaks to me. I'm not going to do what my dad does. I'm not going to say what my mom said. I'm doing the same exact thing. All it took was one child. And then the next just came. And I'm like, what's happening here? I'm flipping. I'm turning into my father. And then you recognize the value of your parents. The value of your parents, they might not be with us here today, but I want you all to be grateful to your parents. They've done a lot for you. They might not know any better. They might have shortcomings. My father has shortcomings, but may Allah bless him, he tried his best. And all your parents are trying their best. They have shortcomings. I don't want you to flip out on them and say, what have you done to me? You destroyed my life. They're trying their best. But you should also try your best. Don't be lazy. This month is not about being lazy. This month is about getting stronger. And Rehan will tell you about that. When you don't put too much food in your system, your body becomes stronger, believe it or not. Not as you think. I mean, he'll tell you about the protein shakes and all that good halal stuff, you know, but I'm talking about you're going to get endurance. I remember in high school that the coach used to make us run the, the, the mile, you know, and how long we can do the mile, and stamina, how much stamina do you have. Fasting will teach you to have that stamina. So fasting is not supposed to make you lazy. Your dad does all the work, your mom does all the work, and you're just chilling, and you're like, yeah, mashallah, my mom cooks good food. Why weren't you cleaning up afterward? Why weren't you helping out? And this is a time where I want the parents also to recognize it. I'm one of your sons. Just look at me as one of your sons, not as one of your daughters, please. So I'm just one of your sons. Recognize that your sons and your daughters are going through a lot of struggles. They're trying their best as well. But they're having some type of identity crisis. They're in a completely foreign environment than the one that you were raised up in. I know that you were cool when you were a youth, but that was like a 19... Something. They are in 2010 plus. I'm no longer cool and I'm only like 1999. But that's like back in the days. Like, if I'm going to talk about the Quran, I'm going to say one of the bad habits that Muslims have in the month of Ramadan is to recite the Quran quickly. You know what the joke I was going to use? I'm going to be like, so don't recite Quran like tongue twister and bone thumbs and harmony. But that's all in the 90s. Now I got to tell you, like Eminem, I guess, and 50 Cent and those guys, and I don't know who else came on the scene after that. I'm not up to date with them. But that's the reality. So the parents, I want you to reach out to your children as well. May Allah bless you. You're sending them to the masjid. But that's not enough. You have to accompany them to the masjid. And they got to see you as a better role model. They don't want to look at you and they're like, look, Sheikh Taha just told us this on Jum'ah and my father is doing the exact opposite. Okay, my dad says go to the masjid. They teach good things. But my dad also is messed up. So we have to be good role models to our children. I'm not speaking to myself because now, not only am I one of your sons, my uncles and aunties, but I'm also a father like you. And my wife is a mother like you, so I have to think about my children too. So like, I can, like, I, like I'm, I'm bridging the generation gap. I'm right in between. I'm getting sandwiched here between the aunties and the, the kids. Between the uncles and the, you know, they say, like, I, used to, I remember a commercial about burgers. It says, if it doesn't get all over the place, it doesn't belong in your face. Remember that? So I was in the 90s too. <laughs> so I think I'm getting all over the place. I'm just completely out of control right now. I hope Brother Isa forgives me. He gave me till 9 o'clock. What I wanted to say about the Quran is, let's spend more time with it because in it there is guidance. There is no doubt. The Shaykh told us about the guidance. And he says that people's hearts are locked up. That's one of the verses of the Quran. They're locked up because. Do you not understand it? Like the, now the non-Muslims at the time of the Prophet said that when the Quran was revealed, they would shake and tremble because they understood exactly what it was saying. Islam was dangerous because it shook their foundations. The Muslims nowadays don't have a clue what the Quran is saying. Let alone the non-Muslims, but I bet you a lot of professors who are teaching Islam, PhDs in Islam, they're not Muslim, but they know more about Quran than the Muslims do. Because we've left our language, we've left our heritage. 
So I want us all to try to go back to Arabic. And there's a lot of opportunities, alhamdulillah. A lot of institutes opening up. Coming even to your own locations. Teaching you basics about Islam, basics about Arabic. When you have a live relationship with the Quran, you find that it's a source of true guidance. And that's what Allah described it as. It is the guidance for those who have taqwa. And we spoke about fasting and we said fasting, the main goal behind it, Allah says, is so you can attain taqwa. Once you attain taqwa, you will become one of those people who will be guided by the Quran. It's all mixed together. In the Quran, Allah says, I only created you guys to worship me and obey me. In the Quran, Allah says, there's only one way of life you going to accept from me. That's why last week, May Allah bless the brother from the board who told me, tell the Muslims that they have to be happy, they have to be proud of what they have. I want you to be happy. All these people who are in misery outside, and Brother Jacob will tell you right now, they're all in misery because they don't know their purpose of existence. One, they have to research for it. Two, and number three, they don't know that there is only way of existence, way of life that Allah will accept from them. They will try tirelessly. And they will be going in an empty circle. I met a sister, she's 37 years old. A couple of days ago, they came to our house. She told me about her father. He's been studying theology for 40 years. He's upset with the church, he's an ordained minister. He left Christianity, he got into all types of different religions. Not only that, he also got into Native American faiths, Native American religions. And now she tells me he guides the people who are godless, the people who are away from God. I said, how does he do that? What religion does he follow? He says he doesn't really follow religion. I said, I know what religion he follows. He follows his own religion. It's not enough for you to do your own research and then come and start something new, invent something new. Something that's been in existence since, since the time Allah created the first man, Adam. And I want to disagree with all the biology teachers that you have. May Allah reward you, my dear father. And he is my father in Islam because we're supposed to respect our elders. And this is something that we have to say. I'm, I'm sorry I'm speaking in a loud voice to all my uncles and aunties. But I'm trying to reach to the hearts. And the hearts sometimes they don't hear except if you're bumping and jamming real loud. Because at least like, I, I know, I can't even listen to Quran when it's quiet. I have to jam it. Because that's my background, I'm jamming it all the time, bumping it. So, once people recognize the purpose of existence, they recognize that Allah so just all along had one way of life of His creation, which is Islam. That's the way of life of all the creation, the heavens and the earth. Allah says, وَلَهُ أَشْلَمَ مَنْ فِي السَّنَوَاتِ وَمَنْ To Allah, everything in existence has submitted. Including the non-Muslims, they're in a state of submission and natural submission. Because they can't get themselves alive or make themselves die. In the sense, except with Allah's will. So everything is submitting to Allah. But we're speaking about submitting your choices. Submission to Allah, that's what Islam means. To surrender and submit yourself to Allah's commandments. To obey Him and to do so with sincerity so you can achieve peace with yourself within, so you're not stressed out in a state of misery, not knowing why your name is Ahmed or your name is Reza. And Allah, Allah knows what happened to my homie Reza. I don't know where he's at now. I ask Allah to guide him. And to guide all of us. But that's the situation. We're not recognizing our purpose of existence. We're losing track. And then we're given a lot of you know, commandments and you know, you're supposed to do this and not do that. But we don't recognize the lawgiver. We don't recognize the one we're supposed to submit to. You know the law, if you're going to run a traffic light and you see a popo, you're going to be stopping. You're not just going to cross the line and, because he's going to give you a ticket. So you know the lawgiver and you know the one who's going to implement the law. We have not recognized the law. We have not become aware of Allah so in the sense of saying, he's in charge, he's in control, he can take my life any minute. He's the one who gives me whatever I have and he's the one who takes whatever I have. Recognizing that, submitting to Allah the one who does so, whoever does submit to Allah according to his commandments is a Muslim. So I want all of us to remember and to research. Make this season a season of research. Good news, you don't have school, except if your school's all track or you're taking a summer session. So I want you to pick up the book to let you recognize what Islam is all about. I suggest da'wah books, the books that the brothers and the sisters give to non-Muslims to tell them about Islam. That's what I did in my research. After I read all the religions from all their sources, then I started reading about Islam from all the sources, what the non-Muslims said, what the fake Muslims said, what all the Muslims said, and I was praying to Allah to guide me because I wasn't sure. I was a Muslim. I'm not saying you guys are not Muslim because you're not completely knowledgeable about your purpose of existence. Alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed you. You are a Muslim. You don't have to struggle as much as Brother Yaqub and others who struggle. But I'm saying when I researched, I prayed to Allah Azza wa Jal, and then I read some of these da'wah materials. And then I recognized so many things. My first language, I told you guys, is Shabi Arabic. But I didn't know what Salah means. 
Salah, what it means in Arabic. And because we're coming to the month of Ramadan, I didn't know what Siyam is. I know Siyam is don't eat and don't drink. Because at that time I was too young to know the third part. You all know what the third part I mentioned it already. It's the X-rated thing. But when I read the Dharma materials, it said Siyam linguistically means to abstain. Abstinence. In the West, of course, the only abstinence they know is one kind, right? The safe way. It's to abstain. Well, Siyam, linguistically, and I told this to some brothers before, to abstain from everything. So you say, Slimtu an al I have abstained from talking, I've shut up. And this is what Mary, Maryam, said in the Quran, Inni nalaktu al rahman al-Sawma, I have vowed a pledge of abstaining, فَلَكُ كَلِّمَ الْيَوْمَ إِنْ سِيَّا So I'm not going to speak to any human being. Her fasting was the literal fasting, fasting of the tongue, not speaking anymore. When, when anything stops, you say Islam, Fulan, Islama, such and such. You know, so that's the linguistic meaning. And it's related to the Islamic terminology, which is to abstain from specific things, as the scholars say. Abstaining from lawful drink, lawful food, and lawful marital relations for a particular period of time. So it's abstinence and not indulgence. And I want to remind all of you, and I want you to remind your parents, and if your mom is working too hard in the kitchen during the Ramadan, please tell her mom, the Prophet's messenger only ate dates when he broke his fast. I don't need you to cook all the food you find on the Food Network. You are not super chef. And you're not in any reality TV show. I want you to relax and worship Allah more. And if Baba wants a lot of food, I want Baba to give us his cooking expertise. <laughs> and this is out of love for Baba, because I want Baba, as Brother Rehan is going to tell us, I want Baba to go on a diet during the month of Ramadan. Because Ramadan is about abstinence, not indulgence. So we want to cut down on the food, cut down on the drink. And then I think I'll end it up with that. I'm going to tie it in with the nutritional stuff. So right now what I'm doing in basketball is throwing a lob and alley you. Rayhan is going to dunk it. But Rayhan is so big, mashallah, he's going to break the backboard and the rim. <laughs> I ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to bless our Messenger Muhammad who brought us this guidance to raise his rank and to bless him and to have mercy on him and his family and those who follow his righteous guidance to the last day as he did with Ibrahim and his righteous followers. Walhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. All praise is due to Allah, the one who created us and the one who created everything. And I praise him for guiding me personally to my purpose of existence and guiding all of you to come here Jum'ah in the evening of Saturday. This is Saturday Eve. And uh, we ask Allah to bring us closer to Ramadan and to allow us to fast it, to worship Allah the way He wants to be worshipped. Wallahu a'ala, Allah knows best. I need a break, man. He just said he wants an extension. Okay, I, I propose, because uh, we have a very short time for Brother Rayhan, it's not going to do him enough justice uh, to speak about the health benefits. So, uh, about 9.25 we want to give Adan for prayer, so Brother Rayhan will only have 10 minutes, which is not enough time in my opinion. I'm suggesting, if you don't mind Sheikh, uh, that you can speak until 9.25, we'll give Azan after prayer. Brothers who can stay and sisters who can stay, we can listen to the talk by Brother Rayhan. That's not cool, you agree with that? You know what that's going to do? Strip me of the assist. <laughs> so if, that, if, that's, if that's fine with you Sheikh, I mean... Okay, uh, it's not fine for me to keep on talking. But I want to hear some of what you have to say now. And that's why I brought you all closer. Because I might not be able to be in the later on question and answer session or what have you. So I want you to speak and tell if you have anything to say or forever hold your peace. You got a chance right now. If I forgot to mention this, I love you all for the sake of Allah. And I ask Allah to bless you all and to bring us all together and to join us in Jannah and Firdaus and the highest of all of the paradise. And we ask you to have mercy on all of us and to guide us to know our purpose of existence and to help us to guide our neighbors and our friends and the people who live amongst to their purpose of existence. Because they're lovely people. I mean, that sister that visited us, she was convinced about Islam. She has no doubt about it. Of course, guess what? She's going to take over her process religion, she says. So I said, that's, that's trouble if you believe in Islam because you're going to switch his plans. So, uh, but alhamdulillah, she's coming along. She spoke to my wife and hopefully before Ramadan, She'll become Muslim and she starts fasting with us, inshallah. So make dua for her. Her name is Sister Heather. Uh, she has a problem though. She said, you know, I believe that God is the most important thing and I only believe in one God. 
But she says, each one of us has God within themselves. So that's where you find out that this is a man-made religion. It doesn't have prophetic wisdom. Now the best thing about Islam is, yes, every newborn is going to be born on Fitrah, as the Prophet says, Kullu mawludin yuladu'ala Fitrah. Every human being who was born onto this earth, or anywhere else, even if he was born in outer space, he's going to be born with a natural inclination to submit to his creator. Like if somebody gives birth on an island, and then leaves the child on an island all by themselves, that child will recognize that someone created me, and I have to worship him. That's how man is, before man gets twisted in his mind. So don't believe that the first man was naked. The first man was Adam, السلام, again I'm going to reject what your biology teacher tells you. The first man was Adam and he was clothed with clothing from paradise that Allah gave him. He did not expose his private parts. So being nude is not being natural. Being nude is being an animal. And that's why the Muslims cover themselves. So the first man submitted to Allah and that was the case. But the Prophet says, but his parents either make him a Jew, a Christian or a fire worshipper. Basically, his environment is going to affect him. And we're all affected by our environments. Even if we're born into Muslim families, we pick up the religion of culture and tradition from our family, because that's our environment. So when a new Muslim comes on the scene, they're like, uh, why are you doing that? He's like, yeah, this is what I read in the book. This is what Allah said. He's like, yeah, but that's not how we do it back home. See, culture took precedence to revelation. So that's why we want to go back to revelation, inshaAllah ta'ala. So the problem with man-made religion is that somebody will recognize that I told Heather, I said, you are so close to the truth. You believe that there is only one God, and you believe that He needs to be worshipped. And she worships Allah the whole day. She makes a lot of prayers. Basically what we do is think of, we do that all day too. So she prays all the time. But she has a problem with the concept of God. Why is that? Because prophetic guidance does not come to her, does not show her the way. That's why Allah did not leave us unattended. He sent us messengers. Throughout humanity's history, there have come messengers to teach people how to worship Allah. Don't invent it. Don't think that this is the way it's supposed to be done. There was a guy sent to you. Shaykh Taha said about Hajj guy, when you go to Hajj, you have a shaykh who teaches you what to do. Well, we have prophets who told us how to live our lives and how to submit to Allah and how to perform Islam. One of the things they teach us is the correct beliefs. The correct beliefs, and that belief tells you that Allah is not in His existence, is not, is not in His creation. Allah is separate from His creation. So we cannot believe that God is in every single one of us. Back in the days, there was a Wu-Tang Clan, and when they speak to one another, they say, What's up, God? Yo, God, because he believes that you're a God, you've got God in you. Of course, that's only if you had certain genes, and you're from the East Coast. They're called five percenters. Mind you, they picked up the word Islam too, they're called five percent Muslims. So, you don't believe that Allah dwells within you, Allah is far above that, Allah is far above any imperfection. That's what the prophets came with. They came with that guidance to tell us who Allah is, and to tell us how to worship Him correctly. The last thing I want to tie in, and they told us that we're short of time, and subhanAllah, this whole life is, is a test, and this life is very short. The sister also reminded me to say, how do we take advantage of our time? Because Ramadan, remember, is only 29 or 30 days. It's not that long. I can't believe it, but I've been in Southern California now for more than that time, in this summer break. And it went by like this. I can't believe that it's been a week that I came and met Brother Isa and the beautiful brothers and sisters here in this district last week. But it went like this. Ramadan also will go like this. And Allah swears by time and the passage of time. And He says that everybody is going to be in a state of destruction, a state of bankruptcy. So the ones who don't have paychecks and they're broke. That's the reality of all humanity except the ones Allah made an exception for. And He says those individuals have four qualities. And that's what I want to end up with, and this is called Surah Al-Asr. A very powerful surah that some of the scholars say it encompasses all the realities and the miracles of the Qur'an. It has the ability to transform people. And Surah Al-Asr, Allah says, when Asr, he swears by the passage of time, and only Allah has the ability and is able to swear by anything from His creation, we can only swear by Allah. He says, indeed, all of humanity is in a state of destruction, bankruptcy, and in a state of being broke, completely corrupt. But he made an exception, he says, except for four categories of people. Except for those who have correct faith, correct beliefs. And those beliefs are the beliefs that was brought by the messengers. Not by the man, this man, Heather's father. He basically goes and contemplates on a mountain right now, and he gets revelation. So that's what God tells him to say. 
So that's why a lot of people do. They're like, I'm going to go pray to God and they go find a tree or find something and pray to God and their mentality. True belief and believing in God is the beliefs that were brought by the messengers and what the messengers brought. Who Allah is and what He deserves. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ عَمَلُوا Those who have correct beliefs and that's not sufficient. They must add something else. وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ And they backed up their actions. They backed up their words because belief, sometimes people say, you know what, I believe, man, I'm a Muslim. I got, I love Islam. My daughter yesterday, I saw she wears a shirt. Uh, uh, what did it say? What did it say? I'm a happy Muslim or something. Something like that. And my daughter is three months old. Of course she has no clue what her shirt is saying. And a lot of us do that. My name is Ahmed, but I got no clue what that means. When Amir told me, I didn't know what it was. In high school, I couldn't explain what Islam is to people. Because I didn't know myself. How could I explain something that I don't know? So I want you all to know. When Amir al-Salihat backed up their words with actions. So that belief must be translated into actions. And with no actions, there is no belief. وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالْحَقِّ They encourage and they enjoy each other to do goodness and to do truth. That was their thing. Their thing is, brother, I want you to do better. I'm looking out for you. Sister, I got your back. Even if it's difficult, I'm here by your side. And that's what we all want. During the month of Ramadan, we want a companion that can take us to the masjid, not take us clubbing. Or, I mean, there's different types of clubs I hear. So the worst of them is the hookah club I hear, especially in Orange County. A lot of the Middle Eastern people, they, they enjoy hookah clubbing. So, instead of taking you to the hookah club, I want them to take you to ICOI. And I want you to pray behind Sheikh Muhammad and behind Sheikh Ibrahim. And I want you to benefit from Dr. Inad and from the other Sheikh who's going to be explaining what you're going to be hearing in the, in the Salah. And the third special mysterious guest. <coughs> That's an inside joke, only certain individuals know what that means. They enjoin and they encourage each other to do truth. They encourage and enjoin each other. As I said last week, one of the keys of success and happiness is patiently persevering. What Allah said was somebody who must recognize that this life is a test. And that's what Allah said. Allah said He created us so we can worship Him. And He also said that He created us to test us. He also said He created us to test us. So when you say, God, why do I have to fast? It's a test. And I'll give you the first answer that answers everything else. When Adam was given all of paradise and he was said, don't come close to that tree. If you answer why that took place, you got the answers to all the mysteries of life. Why did Allah tell Adam, don't eat from the tree? Why? He gave him everything. He just told him, look, don't come close to that tree. Tree. It was a test. Every other commandment that comes after that is a test. And we either pass the test or fail the test. So, what Tawasul was someone they enjoy and they encourage each other to patiently persevere because life is a test, there is difficulties, and we all have to have somebody to remind us, brother, be patient. Sister, be patient. I'm going to remind my brother. He's trying to get married, I'm going to tell him. Be patient. A sister is going to say, you know, I'm having difficulties in school. I'm going to say, be patient. An auntie and an uncle is going to tell me, I'm having struggles with my kids. I'm going to say, be patient. But make dua for them. Pray to Allah to guide them and facilitate the means for them to be guided. So, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Except for those who have correct beliefs. وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Backed up their beliefs with righteous actions and correct actions according to the way shown by the Messenger. وَتَوَاصُوا بِالْحَقِّ They encourage each other. And they were involved in da'wah and inviting others upon truth. وَتَوَاصُوا بِالصَّرُ They encourage each other to be patient and to persevere. And this is the month of patience. SubhanAllah, isn't Islam amazing? It all ties in with each other. Shabbat Ramadan and our Shaykh Allah said, is the month of patience. And you know how you're patient? Because you know you can eat and you can drink when nobody's watching you. But the only thing that prevents you is Allah. Because you know Allah is watching you. And look at that and praise yourself for that. And say, Alhamdulillah, Allah guided me to be Muslim. To have control over my carnal desires. I don't need a trainer per se, even though it's very good to have a specialist like Brother Rayhan. But because Allah and my consciousness is there and it's reminding me, Allah is ordering you to be patient. And then, of course, Allah Azzawajal, with patience, He makes He makes ease. And that's why you break the fast and you get some of the goodies that Rayhan is going to be telling you about after Salah, inshaAllah ta'ala. I think I'm done. Wallahu a'lam. Allah knows best. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakatuh.